do what thou wilt should be the whole law. Welcome back to the next session of our seminar on little essays toward truth. Let's just get right down to the to the text. So I'm gonna share my screen, bring up the text that we're looking for. There we go. Can I share screen? There we go. Okay, uh, Stephen, if you could go ahead and just read this first paragraph where it says the aim of him. The aim of him who would be master is single. Men call it personal ambition. That is, he wants his universe to be as vast and his control of it perfect as possible. Okay, so here we have our definition of mastery. And the key here is going to be what the definition of this word control is. Control in what sense? So let's go ahead now. And uh, Henry, if you could read the second paragraph. Few fail to understand. Few, few fail to understand this aim, but many fail in the formulation of their campaign to attain it. Some, for instance, fill their purse with fairy gold, which when they try to use it is found to be dead leaves. Others attempt to rule the universe of another, not seeing that they cannot even take true cognizance thereof. Okay, Stephen, let's do our third paragraph, the proper method. <laughs> the proper method of extending one's universe, besides the conventional apparatus of material science, is tripartite, evocation, invocation, and vision. Control is a matter of theoretical and practical acquaintance with magical formula, but notably of also of self-discipline. The ground is to be cons consolidated and all contradictions resolved in higher harmonies by the various trances. Okay, here we go. Here's our definition of control. self discipline. That's what Crowley means by control, under which you are able to uh, have the largest possible magical universe as possible and the greatest amount of control over it. So, of course, by magical universe, um, we mean in accord with our phenomenological method that we're using in this class, uh, what's called the life world, meaning this is the not equivalent to, uh, or at least precisely equivalent to the physical universe that's known by the natural sciences. But instead, what we mean by the life world is the kind of the intersubjective social space of relationships that we find ourselves in and uh, meaningful uh, connections that we have to uh, uh, events that are occurring based on a kind of historical narrative that we're embedded within. And so the life world is necessarily constructed in terms of linguistic significations because the meaning that things have within the life world is determined by the uh, linguistic meaning that we give to things within it, nouns, verbs, and so forth, that define things within the life world. Because the mere uh, physically present world that's investigated by the physical sciences doesn't know that we're there. And so human beings create a kind of historical narrative that they're part of as subjects, and everything within that narrative gets semiotically demarcated and defined. And that space is not, it overlaps with and relates to, but is not directly the same as uh, the physical universe known by, say, physics or whatever. So that's the magical universe. And so because the meanings that we assign to it as human beings are what give the life world meaning, it means that we can have control over that life world. So um, Friedrich Engels says that human beings uh, produce their history, but then that history that they produce then produces them, their possibilities, their potential identities and so forth. And so the kind of control that Crowley is talking about here is to get control over that productive process so that we're able to self-consciously be pausing ourselves within the narrative of history, um, which is ultimately produced by human beings, but that process of self-production is alienated from us. And so the history that we're within uh, appears to us as a kind of alien foreign object that has control over us, and we want to get that control back. Um, and the means to that 
is in what is called in magic, the true will. And so if we can find the true will, then we achieve our most dynamic, creative relationship to our magical universe, such that we're able to um, relate ourselves to it in a way that most expresses our optimal potentiality for being. And that's the goal. That's the goal of mastery. So um, if control is therefore self-discipline, um, this is going to primarily be for the particular magician over their own perspective, over their magical universe. Now, obviously, this inter this is an intersubjective space, so it overlaps with other people's uh, viewpoints. But nevertheless, um, from the point of view of our own individual, necessarily individual existence, um, the control that we're seeking is necessarily going to involve a unique expression of the true will that's unique to our own existence. So that's a conversation and dialogue, love, we could say, with other uh, existences. And yet what we're contributing has to be necessarily unique. And so um, now what I think is interesting about this, uh, Crowley talks about the will or the true will and as a kind of uh, self-discipline or self-mastery. And what I think is inter interesting about how this relates to the larger um, philosoph Western philosophical tradition is, is that this is happens not by coincidence, to be exactly the same definition that Friedrich Nietzsche has of what Nietzsche calls will to power. So um, Friedrich Nietzsche, as everybody knows, has this concept will to power. And this is frequently misinterpreted as um, you know, some kind of political power that we would have over other people. And this is not Nietzsche's own real understanding of what is the deepest understanding of will to power. For Nietzsche, if um, so, for Nietzsche, we all seek most fundamentally psychologically this thing that he calls will to power. But if we express that as some kind of power over others, Nietzsche thinks that this is a very vulgar, leveled off, uh, unsatisfactory expression of the will to power. Will to power for Nietzsche is primarily uh, a kind of self discipline or will to have self mastery. And so he talks about this as living one's life as a work of art. And so the uh, literary critic and philosopher, Harold Bloom, um, uh, who's very interested in this kind of Nietzschean concept, says that uh, Nietzsche's philosophy is ultimately a philosophy for artists. It's a, it's a philosophy for creative people who want to um, live their life as a kind of um, uh, artistic, creative self-expression of their potentiality for being. And that just dovetails very nicely with the Thelemic concept of will. And um, now there are political expressions to this, and we will get to that just a little bit later. Um, okay, now let's talk about how this relates to the method of magic. So sharing our screen again, we see here um, he talks about what he calls the tripartite uh, magical formula. And these are three things, evocation, invocation, and vision. Vision here is synonymous with trance. So um, what do we mean here? Okay, invocation is where you... Uh, Basically, invocation and evocation are two versions of vision or trance. So really, vision here is the primary category, and then that can be expressed as either invocation or, or evocation. Invocation is where uh, the particular spiritual pr uh, principle or um, imagery is uh, manifested um, in internally as a kind of psycholo immediate psychological elevation, a kind of shift again in what Heidegger calls the state of being, the befindly kind, the basic um, hermeneutical or interpretive or precognitive orientation towards the world, which then affects or suffuses all of our 
uh, perceptions and understandings at this very deep fundamental level of our basic orientation towards being. So in invocation, we directly experience that uh, in an immediate psychological way. So we invoke whatever spiritual principle, angelic name or form, Sephiroth or whatever, uh, directly into our own being. In evocation, there's a an external projection which we then encounter as a seemingly external event or occurrence, which we then relate to to understand or know that principle. So, of course, the most familiar paradigm of this is like uh, evocation of spirits, where you situate yourself in a circle and then you have a triangle outside the circle where you um, uh, imaginatively project the principle that you're evoking into the triangle. And then, for example, you might have some incense there that's sending up a lot of smoke and then kind of like a Rorschach where you have a, a, like an ink blot that you can then uh, see an image in. With the smoke, you can then see the image of the spirit. Or you might just imagine that the spirit is in that triangle and talk to it. Uh, or you could have this in a dream, or you could have a kind of waking dream, what Carl Jung calls the act of imagination, where you just use your imagination and you imagine that you're talking to the particular spirit that you're evoking. And uh, anybody could do this at any time. It's an ability that we all have. And this is formalized in magic through various procedures. Okay, these are all functions of vision, which is um, a version of, again, this overlapping category of trance. Okay, so trance obviously relates to the word transcendence. And this can be understood in two senses. So, um, in one sense, there's a transcendence of a kind of ecstatic, um, affective manifestation, um, a kind of ecstasy of the self where you're experiencing, you're, you're brought beyond the limited sense of self to experience or intuit uh, the self more in a kind of wholeness, beyond the limits of the immediate um, conventional ego experience. Um, or of uh, just the um, repetitious responses of the automatic consciousness. So this wholeness of the psyche, Kabbalistically, is called neshama and um, involves a kind of unification of the ruach, which is our usual sense of ego self, and um, the unconscious, which is the nefesh. So when these two things are brought into a kind of wholeness or communication, the shama or the wholeness of the psyche is then manifested. This is what Carl Jung calls the self archetype, self with a capital S, which he defines as the wholeness of the psyche. And so this is what's being a kind of projection towards this wholeness is uh, what's being sought in trance. And when we can achieve that projection towards a kind of uh, wholeness of the psyche, this is how uh, the true will then manifests itself as what uh, Freud calls the drive as a kind of um, surplus or excessive manifestation in um, excess of just the immediate libidinal automatic instinctual responses. Um, so that's one sense of transcendence, uh, transcendence. And then another sense of transcendence, which Crowley is talking about here in our passage, let's bring it up again. He talks about uh, the consolidation and how contradictions are resolved in higher harmonies by the various trances. So what that means is that there's a kind of consolidation or reconciliation of the contradictions within the psyche that we might call what Freud calls the complexes, uh, traumatic hangups that we have that are limiting our growth in the development of the psyche. And through the invocation or evocation of the wholeness of the psyche, the manifestation of neshama, these contradictions can be reconciled and overcome and healed. And so we're able then to um, overcome the limitations that are created through the necessarily traumatic experience that we have uh, as we're growing as, as persons, and then continue to, um, uh, to grow. So um, how this works is that um, the most basic kind of 
linguistic semiotic programming of the psyche is what the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan calls the imaginary with capital I. We've talked about this in some previous uh, classes. And this relates to uh, what we've also talked about, which is uh, what's called in philosophy the transcendental horizon, which is the structuring, the linguistic structuring of the psyche in terms of which we um, are then able to have the categories with which we are able to understand and encounter the world. Again, this idea of the phenomenological life world as a kind of linguistically constructed uh, experience of a shared uh, uh, of a shared uh, social world uh, that has uh, roles and narratives that we're participating in as an embedded subject. And all of that is linguistically structured. And that structuring within the psyche is, again, what's called either the transcendental horizon or this other concept that's the same concept, basically, called the imaginary. And so we all inherit from our initial uh, child uh, socialization as children a particular inherited structuring of the imaginary. But um, this structuring is, in terms of um, uh, is traumatic in terms of the initial socialization, which is never even, which is never just harmonious. And so the imaginary has to be reprogrammed. We have to readjust it to more adequately fit our actual life experience. And this is what magic is able to do because we're able to evoke our true will, which is a true will towards a kind of seeking of a wholeness of the psyche and so this involves a kind of reprogramming, uh, reassessment and readjustment of the of the shama, of the of the imaginary in terms of again of our optimal potential for being. And so this is what we're this is what we're seeking and invoking uh, in magic. And this is what trance allows us to uh, gain access. It allows us to get uh, self conscious access to these deep unconscious layers of the self that we can then harmonize. Um, in terms of um, this more ideal magical mapping of the self, it's called the tree of life, which provides a kind of map that we're trying to uh, conform or readjust ourself uh, in terms of. And then um, it provides a kind of map, a model that allows us to harmonize ourselves in the terms of our, again, achieving a more optimal, um, uh, optimal state of our being. So um, this uh, first occurs at a personal level, which is represented by Tifereth on the tree of life. But then when we get into communication with that level, which is represented in magic by what's called the knowledge and conversation with the holy guardian angel or the higher and divine self, when we're able to achieve that, then this kind of necessarily then implies a shift to addressing contradictions at the larger impersonal or social level. And then this then is the function of mastery, not just adaptation, but mastery, where we're um, trying to figure out not just at a personal, but also at a larger social, historical, interpersonal level, how to optimize the different relations that are going on there. So probably not skip ahead here. Probably that now talks about this here in this section. So uh, Hillary, uh, you haven't read that. If you could pick up where it says that it is then no more than simple good sense. It is then no more than simple good sense for the Magus to formulate his general political aim in some such terms as these. To secure the greatest possible freedom of self-expression for the greatest possible number of points of view of which issue the practical aspect may be phrased as follows. To improve the human race in every conceivable way so as to have available for service the greatest possible variety of the best instruments of imaginable. And this is the rational justification of the apparently imbecile and too often sentimental hip hypocritical aphorism Love all beings, serve mankind. Okay, these uh, happy little platitudes. And um, 
Crowley is here trying to kind of expand and explain how these have magical meaning. So this is connected to uh, what in Buddhism is called the Bodhisattva vow, which is the idea that once you've achieved enlightenment, you then uh, pledge yourself as um, part of that enlightened perspective to assist all other beings to achieve enlightenment. And this therefore is in a way the purpose, uh, the purpose of enlightenment beyond um, some kind of immediate selfish or ego. In other words, enlightenment is not just for you, it's for everybody. Um, it's the basic possibility that all sentient beings have, which is this possibility of enlightenment or illumination, um, or to receive the Luke's, the Gnostic light, uh, to understand that we're all divine beings, that we are ourselves the ground and source of meaning in reality, that we can optimize that uh, possibility of our being. Uh, and so this is, of course, um, something that functions interpersonally. It's a, it's a goal that's necessarily social because part of what you discover as you're achieving enlightenment is, is that you're an innately social being. And in fact, uh, Alistair Crowley, uh, like Friedrich Nietzsche, like Karl Marx, like all kind of serious modern Western philosophers, uh, understands any concept of individuality as innately social. So um, the uniqueness that each of us has as a kind of individual um, is a uniqueness that is also at one and the same time fundamentally socially expressed, that we're outwardly directed in terms of our being. Um, Martin Heidegger uh, expresses this by saying that uh, Dasein or human existence is fundamentally, he says, ecstatical. Um, ecstasis means to be out of oneself, that we're always uh, projecting in our uh, ways of being, um, uh, skills and practices that are always already related to a social milieu of uh, goals and practices and projects that are always occurring within a, a, a inner subjective social life world that involves other other existences. So we can't not be social in our uh, sense of self identity and our aims and purposes. And what happens as we're seeking on the magical path is that this becomes more and more explicit. So as we're going inward, we're actually going outward at the same time and vice versa. So these two directions are in fact the same. And this is the realization that then occurs. Um, personal enlightenment is always um, interpersonal enlightenment at the same, at one and the same time. Now, this is also represented in the Rosicrucian Manifesto, the Fama Fraternitatis, this uh, famous text from the 1600s, where if you remember, it says in that text that the brethren of the Rosy Cross uh, profess only to heal the sick in that gratis, meaning for free. And that links the purpose of um, the AA, which we recall uh, includes and folds within it the Order RC, the Rose, Order of the Rose Cross. Um, the purpose of the AA is the enlightenment upon all planes of the whole of humanity. And those who do not share in this goal are outside of the great order, um, either because they're what's called a, a black brother, meaning they've decided that their enlightenment is only going to be for their selfish self-benefit, uh, and therefore they cut themselves off from their relationship to other human beings, uh, which means that eventually their karma will be used up and their uh, their self group will then be extinguished, um, as opposed to the adept or master who, because their enlightenment is ultimately for the sake of the whole of humanity, which of course includes themselves, um, they have an unlimited source of energy to draw from. And so therefore, rather than exhausting um, their available stock of energy and disintegrating, um, they are able to, in some sense, extend their being to infinity and achieve a kind of impersonal immortality. Um, 
the black brother excludes themselves from that possibility. Uh, or you could be what in Buddhism is called a Pratakya Buddha, which means that you're a Buddha who achieves enlightenment, but then you don't teach. And um, this could happen, but is um, you're you're precluded from Buddhism. Um, you're you're not a bodhisattva if you're doing that, and therefore the religious system of Buddhism doesn't apply to you. Again, you're outside of the great order. Uh, in principle, there can be people who fall into this category, uh, but in practice, um, more usually what happens is that you achieve enlightenment and then you discover that you've got these things that you have to do. And of course, the, the, these projects that your true will posits for you are of course going to be occurring in uh, within the world and therefore are innately social. And so you then begin to engage and if not formally teach in a religious sense, what you're doing is teaching others in some sense. Uh, for example, if you're an artist, if you do music, if you paint, if you write poetry, if you raise a family, um, you know, whatever you're doing that you're showing up to, you know, do your creative thing that you need to be doing, uh, this is going to be occurring in a world with other people and is therefore uh, participating in the ultimate purposes of the great uh, order. Um, Okay, so let's continue then again with our text. So Stephen, if you could pick up where it says that is upon the political plane. I don't know if Stephen stepped away. Uh, Henry, if you could pick up where it says that is upon, oh, Stephen, you're there, okay. Sorry, I, was, I realized I was reading and I was on mute. Uh, it's all good. Just pick up where it says that is, etc. cetera. Uh, that is upon the political plane for also these two phrases contain one, the magical formula, which is key alike of invocation and trance to the implicit injunction to make clear the way of the magician through the heavens by right ordering of every star. The word serve is indeed misleading and objectionable. It implies a false and despicable attitude. The relationship between men should be brotherly respect, which obtains between noble strangers. The idea of service is either true and humiliating or false and arrogant. Okay, let's take, break down that um, very interesting paragraph here. So first of all, this uh, magical formula, which is the key alike of invocation and of trance, also of evocation, uh, is of course the magical formula of love under will. Now, of course, this is about this thing called sex magic, but let, let's talk about this a little bit more broadly. So this relates to the ecstatic quality of trance. Um, this um, way that we're always kind of standing outside of ourselves of being projecting ourselves upon our possibilities for being within the larger life world as the ultimate expression of the uh, dynamic quality of the true will. And this is love because it's about how we're relating to other beings innately. So therefore, it always has a kind of what Freud calls affectivity, um, meaning it relates to the expression of what we could call libido. Um, and so it, it has a kind of um, uh, loving quality to it, but it's not just reducible to um, uh, sexual love. Freud's basic theory is, is that all human relationships, all affectivity, all investment of the psyche into uh, relationships to its objects of experience is grounded in libido and is therefore grounded in a kind of love, in a kind of seeking for relation with the other. Uh, and that applies to all relationships to uh, objects that the psyche has, that it's our, our fundamental uh, nature of our being, you could say, to seek relationship with the other, to seek a kind of intimacy that takes us out of ourselves and makes us again, seek a kind of large, larger quality to the magical universe. Um, and so this then connects the personal and interpersonal aspects of trance, which again are discovered to really be just flip sides of the same coin. They're really the same. Um, and so uh, love is the affectivity, libido is the bliss or ecstasy that we experience in the moment of intimacy with the other, uh, what Lacan calls jouissance, 
uh, a kind of uh, ecstatic, blissful quality, which is fundamental to the psyche, that no matter what our, um, it's, a, it's a fundamental thesis of psychoanalysis that all psychological states have a kind of affectivity that underlies them. Because as uh, phenomenology posits, all mental states have a kind of intentionality, a kind of aboutness to them, meaning that um, all conscious states are about something, have a kind of content to them. Um, and that aboutness of all mental states uh, has an affect or affectivity to it. And so therefore has a kind of love, if you will, to it. And again, it's love under will because it again has this directed quality. We're directed towards some, some object of our uh, intentionality. Uh, and so therefore, it's our very nature to be expressed in what in the book of the law is called love under will. Um, and so this uh, blissful quality of love mediates all planes with each other. Uh, physical and biological um, pleasure is brought in connection with personal or mental um, affection. Um, and then interpersonal relationship or social relationships or intimacy with others. And then finally, the transcendental horizon of being with a capital B, which is then recognized as being innately social in quality and therefore of the nature of love. Um, so therefore, the true will is always a will to love. And so that's why do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law always is also expressed in its necessary corollary, love is the law, love under will. These two statements go together, and this is, of course, symbolized in magic by the equivalence via gematria of the Greek word for will, which is thelema, and the Greek word for love, which is agape, which both add to 93. So that means these two things are magically the same. Um, and then whenever we say 93, when we greet somebody else as a kind of shorthand for the two expressions, we're, ex we're stating that this is the goal of the great work is love. Uh, we work in love for love to accomplish love. This is the purpose of the great order. And this is what trance gives us access to. And this is what we're always invoking in magic. So this is why the black brother is a kind of anathema because they're uh, turning against love, which means they're turning against against relationship in their selfishness. And so therefore they're in a sense negating their own true nature. And so therefore they will only in the end destroy themselves. Uh, and so therefore uh, it's an ultimately self-defeating, um, it's an ultimately self-defeating uh, goal. Okay, then this other point, the relation between people should be the fraternal respect which obtains between noble strangers. Okay, um, what's going on here is, is that Paul is talking about a kind of democratization of aristocratic dignity in the new eon. In other words, we're all kings and therefore should respect each other uh, just like the something like the uh, aristocrats of the old eon would have a kind of um, regard or respect for each other. Uh, we should all hold ourselves in the highest degree of self-respect, and we should extend that same respect and dignity to all other human beings. Um, and so uh, this is in contrast to the tendency in modernity for everything to become vulgar and common and for uh, social relations to be leveled off um, and for everybody to treat each other like dumb commoners. And Crowley is saying, we shouldn't do that. Instead, um, we should treat each other like the nobility in the past treated each other, but that this should then be extended universally. So that's what he means by noble strangers. Even if you don't know who this other person is, because of course everybody is kind of unique and therefore you can never fully know another person the way that you can know yourself. But nevertheless, you know that all other human existences that you encounter are uniquely uh, divine beings 
and therefore are possessed of fundamental dignity and should be respected as such. And so therefore I claim that uh, democratic norms are therefore deeply appropriate in a polemic context and that uh, authoritarianism that defeats these norms uh, is therefore ultimately unphilemic. So, but anyway, that's the political argument that I think is uh, most appropriately read uh, in these kinds of texts by Kroll. Um, now, in this context, the phrase in the Book of the Law, the slaves shall serve, uh, implies a kind of sex magical formula of voluntary abasement, uh, which relates to a kind of sadomasochistic Jewish thoughts, a kind of uh, playful submission to uh, a certain type of abasement and a kind of love play uh, with others. Uh, and that's the sense in which I think that the, the, the slave shall serve as a, as a magical form. Um, anyway, that's a possible interpretation. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna skip the rest of this chapter where probably kind of waxes on and says some good stuff and that's for another time. Let's now make sure that we're able to cover this other chapter of the time that we have, which is on trance, which is of course the key concept of the book as a whole, uh, which is why it's a little bit unfortunate that it's not clearly defined in this chapter, in my opinion. But nevertheless, based on what has come before, it is possible to clearly understand what's going on in this description. So Henry, if you could read this uh, first paragraph here. The word trance implies a passing beyond. Uh, just uh, insert the word of here. This is an abbreviation for a certain Latin phrase, but just put the word of there. Of the conditions which oppress. The whole and sole object of all true magical and mystical training is to become free from every kind of limitation. Thus, body and mind in the widest sense are the obstacles in the path to the wise. The paradox, tragic enough as it seems, is that they are also the means of progress. How to get rid of them, to pass beyond or transcend them, is the problem. And this is as strictly practical and scientific as that is eliminating impurities from a gas or of adroitly using mechanical laws. Here is the inevitable logical flaw in the sorites of the adept, and that that the is bound. I think that's supposed to be he. They that, he, they, that, that they yeah, are bound. That they are bound by the very principles which it is his object to overcome, and on him who seeks to discard them arbitrarily, they haste to seek a terrible revenge. Okay, obviously that's a misprint. So this is the theme of self liberation which is basic to magic. And this is self-liberation from what the book of the law calls restriction, uh, which is the word of sin or uh, missing the mark. Um, and we're trying to escape from the conditions that oppress. Let's see. Let's see. Object is to overcome them. Uh, but oppress what? which oppress the free creative actualization of our authentically human potentiality for being. Now I say authentically human, uh, meaning that the liberation that we're seeking is not from the conditions of the possibilities of this world in favor of some other world, like that we're gonna achieve salvation in like heaven after we die uh, or something like that, but rather we're seeking liberations of human persons within the framing of their own history, but where that very framing can, under certain circumstances, also be mutable. In other words, um, how much and in what ways that the framing of our experience itself, not just our experience, but the framing of that experience, uh, not just our history, but the conditions of that history, can be modified is something that can't be determined abstractly ahead of time, but only practically and contextually. And this is what Crowley is then saying in the next paragraph, which Hillary, if you could pick up where it says it is in practice. Hmm. 
It is in practice, not in theory, that this difficulty suddenly disappears. For when we take rational steps to suspend the operation of the rational mind, the inhibition does not result in chaos, but in apprehension of the universe by means of a faculty to which the laws of the reason do not apply. And when returning to the normal state, we seek to analyze our experience, we find that the description abounds in rational absurdities. So this faculty that he's referring to, that's neshama. That's the um, uh, access to the, the self-conscious access to the uh, fundamental structuring of programming of the psyche, the imaginary. And so um, we're able to then get access to that and then reprogram that, which can then reprogram or change the frame the state of being within which we're able to perceive or understand our experience. Now, the key phrase here in this paragraph is to take rational steps to suspend the operation of the rational mind. Notice the reduplication of that. Rational steps to suspend reason. In other words, appeal to the infallibility of intuition or faith has no place in this process. Rather, Alistair Crowley is describing the realization of innate negative quality of the operation of our minds. Um, namely, that our, uh, our reason is incomplete. Our rational understanding of the world is incomplete. But if we can grasp that, we can then, as it were, um, we can find the kind of hole in our mind and then project ourselves through that hole to then uh, uh, discover the um, transcend that limited perspective and then grow, grow ourselves. So let me put this another way. Um, so there's this innate negative quality of the operation of our minds. And what we're trying to do is recognize our incompleteness and then project ourselves towards a kind of implicit wholeness of the self with a capital L S in terms of the true will, <clears throat> but based on this very incompleteness of the phenomenal self. In other words, for us to project ourselves towards a kind of psychological wholeness, we have to first understand and recognize that we're incomplete in terms of our immediate uh, rational uh, capacities. And then the means of this projection is necessarily linguistic. Uh, which is, of course, convention. So he says the law of the mind, this is the law of association, of reason, of uh, the use of language to understand, is the sole substance of the universe as well as the sole means by which we apprehend it. There is therefore no true antithesis between the conditions of trance and those of rational thought or perception. Uh, we say that in chess, a knight traverses the diagonal of a rectangle, measuring three squares by two, neglecting its motion as a material object in space. We use abstraction, a metaphor, to be able to grasp reality necessarily. We've described a definite limited relation in terms of a special sense, which works on an arbitrary symbolism. Yet this is precisely how we're able to under magically analyze our experience. This means that our projection towards our potential totality uh, uses language and symbolism in magic, uh, which is uh, conventional and limited, yet it is also a necessary tool because the psyche is itself constructed by language and therefore can be deconstructed by language. Again, Crowley's point is that any attempt to jump out of the context of language by appeal to some kind of immediate truth is a false gnosis. We have to, as Jacques Lacan says, we have to traverse the fantasy. We have to engage with the limit, our limitations, uh, and that zone of limitation is precisely con the conditions for magical trance. Just like our physical body uh, is precisely the context that we're trying to transcend, yet that transcendence is realized through our very biology, through for example, the sex magical practices of using our biology to uh, directly achieve ecstatic trance through the manipulation of our uh, physical possibilities for intimacy. 
Um, and through that very uh, reaching through the limitation, through that use of the limitation, we could reach towards a greater whole. So the limitation is itself the way to get to the larger whole. Um, and in doing that, uh, we have to not um, do what Crowley calls confuse the planes. We have to own our own circumstances, for these are precisely the circumstances of trance, which is our own um, inchoate, chaotic conditions we're in, not apart from the world, but part of it. And then those conditions are the very conditions within which the alchemy of magic is able to occur. And so uh, another way to put this is that our incompleteness is in fact an openness to being with a capital B in terms of which the authentic existence of the true will becomes available for our discernment uh, as a radically contextual possibility of our being, um, which can never be completely alienated from us. So magic in this sense is indeed the transcendental art and science, but understood in this phenomenological sense as the relating of a particular being, what Heidegger calls Dasein, or the Book of the Law calls Hadith, to the horizon of being, with a capital B, which is Nuit, uh, in and through the incompleteness of the semiotic construction of the magical universe. And so we use, um, we use our conditions to achieve transcendence in and through our very incompleteness. And um, this then is, I think the underlying argument of these two very important chapters of the book. Okay, so now we've got about 15 minutes, which again gives us a nice chance to kind of uh, talk about what we've been looking at. Again, there's always more to talk about in the chapter itself, but let's, let's try to have a bit of conversation about uh, some of these ideas. So I'd like to open at this point to questions, comments, conversation about uh, the concepts that we've been we've been looking at. Anyone have any questions? Anything they want to uh, say or share about what we've been talking about? Hillary, Henry. I have. I yes, have Hillary. A, <laughs> I had a, a a quote unquote quick question, which probably isn't. I don't know. How does, does Crowley differentiate between consciousness and mind? He okay, was talking good question. there about law of the mind. Um, what does he mean by that? Law of the mind in this context would be uh, the structure of the mind such that it's able to have the capacities that it does. Um, and in particular, he's interested in the way that um, we use language as a set of conventional relations that then allow us to uh, self-consciously understand then our experience. And then that understanding can then become potentially Gnostic. We can understand um, not just things in a conventional way, but in a magical way about how we're uh, all a center of Gnostic light and how we are the source of the the source and ground of the divine, which is then illuminating the space of our experience. So I think that in the context of this chapter, that's what he means in that sense. Now, um, consciousness and mind, at least in a post-Cartesian modern context, are usually, uh, usually in philosophy synonymous, um, meaning they're just uh, different ways of expressing the same idea. Now, if we're seeking a little bit more precision in terms of what we mean, I think that we could get a better definition that comes again from our phenomenological method, which is that um, in phenomenology, uh, consciousness, which is the quality of mind, uh, is defined in terms of what's called intentionality, which is a, defined as a kind of aboutness of consciousness. In other words, um, consciousness is always a state in which we it is about something. It has some kind of content. So there's no such thing as uh, consciousness just by itself without something that's in or that consciousness is about. So uh, now consciousness can also potentially be about itself. And this is what the yogi is trying to achieve in samadhi, 
to kind of reflect consciousness back on itself. And so you have a kind of intentionality where the intentionality is directed at the structure of intentionality itself. And if you could achieve a kind of one pointedness of this, this is what's called dhyana or samadhi, but that's a specialized um, uh, state that, you know, uh, deserves its own kind of discussion. Usually what we mean by consciousness is, is that um, I have some kind of awareness of something that could be an object of external perception, or it could be some thought that I'm having that has some kind of um, symbolic or semiotic or linguistic content or, or um, uh, aspect to it. And um, one of the important discoveries of modern philosophy is, is that when we're cognizing external objects, um, we never just have a kind of bare experience of an external object. There is always some kind of linguistic contextualization of that object in terms of which we're able to understand it as an object. Uh, Martin Heidegger's way of putting this is to say that when you see a tree, you know that it, the only way that you're able to see a tree is if you already know what a tree is, which is a noun that you learn as part of your linguistic socialization. Um, so it's in terms of language that we're able to experience what's happening around us as having a particular structure that it, it has. So. Um, we see objects, those are defined by nouns. We have to have that kind of, uh, or there's activities that are verbs. We have to already have that kind of um, linguistic structure to be able to understand that there are objects that we're then interacting with through actions. Otherwise stuff is just happening. And, you know, animals may exist in that kind of life world, but as human beings, we don't. If we're a cow, there's some grass and we're eating and that's it and that's who we are and what's going on, but that's not how we exist as human beings. Um, we experience ourselves as a kind, having a kind of personhood, which is again, um, where do we get this concept of an I? It's a kind of um, linguistic category that we, we discover that we have a kind of role, which is that of being a person, which is posited for us kind of ahead of time by society. And we can kind of socialize into discovering what that role is for us again, already in this linguistically defined network of relations. So that's the con that's the magical universe. That's the context within which we have a, what, what we call a mind or a consciousness, which doesn't exist in abstraction from that set of, uh, from, that, from that kind of being in the world, as Heidegger calls it. Um, and so that's magically how I'm interpreting what uh, mind or consciousness is. I don't know if that, does that, address at least in some way your question. <laughs> sure, thank you. Okay, um, <laughs> Henry, you I think had a, had a question. Uh, yeah, I, uh, it's maybe a two-parter. Go for uh, it. I guess, uh, going back to talking about control and yes. how we're in control, mastery in terms of control. So uh, I guess I feel like I interpreted what you were saying as the control we're talking about is control over some kind of narrative, which creates significance. Yes, for ourselves as uh, in terms of our own subjectivity. So we, from our so immediate socialization as children, we're told who we are and what we're supposed to do and what that means. And um, most of the time, this is too limited because we have certain creative potential that we can develop that are in excess of that kind of immediate role that we're given when we start out our life. And so we want to grow into discovering what that kind of deeper or broader role is. We want to expand our magical universe and gain greater control over our, our potential. Great. And I guess the second part of my question is then, given that definition is true will, uh, a, can you, is true will, can that be interpreted as a narrative or a narrative process that you could compare in terms of its, this limitedness or unlimitedness? Yes, but it's, it's a little bit more formal. It's kind of in the background. It's, um, you have a particular narrative and you know, you're trying to discover this, another particular narrative. The true will is the drive, is the psychological push or impulse that propels you towards wanting or trying to do that. That's why it's called will with a capital W. And it's an excess of immediate desire. So Freud talks about two instinctual um, 
dynamics that the psyche has. There's the libidinal dynamic of immediate instinctual um, uh, affectivity that he says is governed by what he calls the pleasure principle. Okay, the pleasure principle is that you're seeking to kind of uh, get this lowest common denominator. Uh, you're, you're suppressing stuff that's gonna like uh, upset you or whatever. So you get, just get this very base level of, um, you wanna try to kind of ground out the psyche into this base level of, of affectivity that isn't, isn't moving around. Bring it down to the kind of lowest common denominator because that's sort of safe. And, um, but it's also really boring. And so this is like the, you know, smoking the cigarette or the, the kind of um, effect that addiction is seeking. And the contrast to that is the dynamic of the death drop, which seeks to, the death here is, is that you're going to die to that level of immediate satisfaction and take the risk of seeking more complex structuring of the psyche. You're going to go on the adventure of life, which is going to have its ups and downs, and you're going to risk that. This is based on what Freud calls the reality principle, meaning rather than withdrawing into narcissism, the psyche instead develops and seeks more complex interactions with the world. And so therefore it can develop and grow. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm identifying the true will with the death drive that operates in terms of the reality principle. So the, um, the drive of the true will is then this dynamic to seek more and more sophisticated complexity, creative complexity of the self, to develop a more complex self than what is kind of immediately available. And that makes us seek adventure, take risks, learn things, and grow as human as human beings. And that's the dynamic that magic is trying to, to bring energy into supporting that, that movement. And so control is then sort of a, a mechanism. Control for... is that will to seek greater uh, greater development for the self. That is the control, is that is that drive, is that seeking of, uh, is seek, the psyche is seeking of its own self-development through a kind of self-discipline that is willing to uh, abandon or set aside immediate satisfactions, to seek more complex goals that involve risks and challenges and disappointments, knowing that there will be an ultimately deeper satisfaction that will be achieved through doing that. That's the control that's being sought. And you, you, I think you just said that that was due to an excess of something. Sorry, I forget exactly what phrase. Well, it's an excessive quality in the sense that um, the psyche and it's a kind of immediate aspect is, is this libidinal dynamic. And the drive emerges as a surplus or excess quality of the psyche that is not part of the calculus of the pleasure principle. So it's a kind of emergent property that if you're, if you're just calculating things in terms of immediate affectivity, um, the calculus of the drive doesn't enter into it. It's another math that gets superimposed onto that. That's a whole nother kind of level that emerges of the, of the psyche. We'll maybe have more to say about that as we continue through the further further chapters. I'm just kind of teasing that out as an idea. Sounds great. Okay, Stephen, we've got just a few minutes left. Do you have anything you wanted to ask or add? Yeah, just a really quick question. So like when they say uh, extend his universe beyond the world of sense perception is called the universe, uh, confusion of the planes. Is that talking about, um, uh, can you elaborate more on like what that means? Is that actually going beyond the normal sense perception but not being well, in this sense perception is just the immediate stuff that you're seeing around you but your being extends radically beyond that domain so your memory extends to the past and gives you a narrative of what's gone before you can posit goals in the future that are not part of your immediate sense experience your subjectivity as a self with a capital s your big self is much much broader than just what you're immediately sensing in the given moment and so in that sense, the true will is trying to get you in contact with that bigger self. I see. Okay. Anyway, that's, I think, the point that Chloe is making. We're coming up on four o'clock, so we're going to have to wrap this up. Thank you, everybody, for joining me again for this week. And we're going to do this again next week. We're just going to keep going ahead with this book. Lots of more interesting philosophy to talk about. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to end this recording. Thank you, everybody. Love is the law. Love under will. Thank you. Nice.